Well, first of all, this is purely money down the drain. Uh, so if they want to rip up another $61 billion, which is not chump change, uh, they, they seem intent on doing it, but it will mean nothing except more destruction for Ukraine. The fact of the matter is, if, if you uh, don't listen to uh, the nonsense in our mainstream media, but listen to your show and others, uh, people would know that uh, this uh, war has destroyed Ukraine. And the longer it continues, uh, the less there will be of Ukraine. It's, it's very simple, actually. Uh, if this goes on longer, Russia will capture more territory. Uh, if it goes on long enough, Russia will capture Odessa, uh, Kiev. Uh, if, if we continue the way we're doing, uh, and this is, a, this is a Biden project that goes back uh, 10 years now, uh, will completely destroy Ukraine. So the idea that this is siding with Ukraine is absurd. Uh, anyone who really follows events knows that we're not siding with Ukraine. We have paid for hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians to go to the front lines and die uh, for uh, more and more territory to be lost. Because the most basic point of this war, which is that we overthrew a government in Ukraine in 2014 that wanted neutrality so that we could push NATO enlargement was reckless, stupid, and doomed to fail. And it failed. Now Biden is uh, just trying to hide the failure to get past November, but the failure is uh, seen on the battleground every day. If the Republicans uh, play into this, it's unbelievable. Shame on them. Uh, they're basically on the right side, although Biden bludgeons them every day. You'll be the one to lose Ukraine. Well, the, the truth of the matter is uh, Biden has been a disaster for Ukraine for a decade. Uh, the disaster is uh, uh, there in the graves of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians and lost territory. This is a war that never should have happened. It was about NATO enlargement where the Russians said no NATO on our borders and Americans who were following this, like our CIA director, uh, Bill Burns, who was then the U.S. ambassador to Russia in 2008, said this is crazy. No way. The entire Russian political class is against this. But Biden and Obama and Hillary Clinton and Victoria Newland, Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken, they just barged ahead. They wrecked everything. And now they want another $61 billion to get them past November. It's, it's a disgrace. It's completely a disgrace. To play devil's advocate, let me you know, give you the other side and then allow you to respond to that. You know, what do you sure. say to people that well, maybe acknowledge there were certainly missteps with, uh, with the expansion of NATO and the provocation, but nevertheless, Russia chose to respond to that with an invasion. Um, the situation in Ukraine is due to that invasion. And so what do you say to people who think, well, but we so we are now responding to that invasion by funding, not committing American troops, but funding a resistance in Ukraine that wants to continue fighting? Well, yeah, the war began 10 years ago when Victoria Nuland not only passed out cookies uh, on Maidan, but uh, engaged in in insurrection to violently overthrow a government in Ukraine. Pretty stupid, pretty stupid to uh, have a regime change operation uh, on uh, a country with a 2,000 uh, kilometer border with Russia. That's our American foreign policy. That's when this war started. This war didn't start in February 2022. It started in February 2014. It started with Newland. It started with Blinken. It started with Sullivan. It started with Biden who was a key person in that whole thing. And then the fighting went on for 10 years. And then in December, 2021, Putin said, look, stop the NATO enlargement. We can avoid an escalation. I talked to the White House at that point. Nah, we don't stop anything. They just thought they had all the cards. We're gonna cut them out of the swift banking system. We're gonna bring the economy to the knees. Bunch of nonsense by ignorant people. And so Putin escalated. He didn't start the war, he escalated the war. And within 
a, basically a week, Zelensky said, OK, 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 we can be neutral. And the Turks mediated negotiations. And then, though the U.S. government wants to hide all of these facts, which are sitting out there for those who know where to find them, the U.S. intervened and told the Ukrainians, you keep fighting. And we have we have our senators who say this is the best the best uh, money the money can buy because it's ukrainians dying not americans they're weakening russia well they're not weakening russia but they are killing ukrainians so this is not responding to putin's invasion the war started 10 years ago and we kept refusing every off-ramp till this day robbie you know you hear putin say and if you listen Every day, we're open to negotiations. And then these fools in the U.S. government say, there's no one to negotiate. They don't want to negotiate. And then President Putin says, oh, we, 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 we're open to negotiation. Oh, there's no one to negotiate is what we hear from the U.S. side. This is just narrative. It's destroyed Ukraine, and they just rip up money like there's no tomorrow. So another $61 billion. And now I hear uh, from, from you that the, the latest plan is to take the illegally confiscated assets of Russia, because there's no legal basis to do this, and use that. That'll be really great for the international financial system, I'll tell you, because these are people who don't think ahead one day. They just improvise day by day, and then they'll find out, oh, things don't work out so well for the U.S. dollar, uh, for uh, the U.S. as reserve currency, for uh, the U.S. place in the world, because these people are acting like clowns, frankly, day by day, not thinking ahead, doubling down on lost gambles, and everything to tell a story so that they can get to the elections in, in the way they see fit. Professor, I want to ask you about how the United States gets out of this now, because I'm reminded of conversations that surrounded the war on Afghanistan for years, which was that we shouldn't have gotten into it. This is a mistake. But now we've destabilized the country. We are in neck deep. We can't just stop funding and abandon this project. And that's a hamster wheel of sorts, right? So there are some people that I think are going to listen to this and say, well, I, I agree with everything you're saying, but what do you do at this point? It's a, you know, is it just a sunk cost? Or is there some obligation to unwind this in a way that's responsible and doesn't leave Ukrainians high and dry? <laughs> Ukrainians are high and dry no matter what we do. We've killed nearly half a million of them through this stupid project. And the ones that, uh, that throw good money after bad are the ones themselves that are personally culpable for this. This is Biden's project. So this is the first starting point. You don't throw li good lives uh, after those already dead and, and uh, good money after bad when you have an absolute failure and disaster on your hands. By the way, this is like every American effort. I'm old enough to remember Vietnam. The same words said about Vietnam. We do this over and over and over again in the US because our so-called leaders have no sense and they don't think ahead. So yes, we have to stop this. But the one thing that we don't do, and it's really a, a bit of a mystery to me, it's the worst I've seen in my whole lifetime, we don't negotiate. Does Biden call Putin and say we need to talk? No, that would be weakness, that would be appeasement. They don't even have the idea that you negotiate anything. And you know, if you try everything by a military approach and a failed one, and you do it in these proxy wars where it's the people themselves uh, in these countries that are dying on the front lines, and you don't know anything about diplomacy, well, you make a complete mess of the world. And so the answer is, uh, the first thing is, the US and Russia should talk to each other because there's a cause of this war, and that's NATO enlargement. And by the way, that's no secret, and that's not propaganda. Even the uh, Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, said that absolutely explicitly, as did the top negotiator 
for Zelensky, uh, David Arakamia. This is a war about NATO enlargement. So why doesn't Biden call up Putin and say, you know what, we got to stop the war and that whole NATO enlargement that I was party to going back to the 1990s and uh, to 2014 coup and all, that was a bad idea. Let's figure out how to stop the war, recognize mutual security and stop the bloodshed and massacres in Ukraine. If Biden were really a acting like a president, that's what he would do. Um, it's been about a year since a group of uh, economists um, wrote an open letter about you, um, yeah. accusing you of denying the agency of Ukraine, peddling Putin talking points, all of those kinds of things. Um, it's a year later. How do you respond to them? Well, I don't respond. I tell them I told you so. I told them so from the beginning that this would be a complete disaster for Ukraine. People don't want to hear this. They don't understand. They don't know enough about American history. I told them Ukraine is going to be like Afghanistan. And boy, is it like Afghanistan right now. So they didn't want to hear. That's not right. That's not fair, Professor Sachs. I was telling them facts. I was giving them some good advice. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear about victory, glory, how Ukraine's going to succeed, uh, that great counteroffensive, all the rest, all the baloney. But I said from the beginning that this would be a disaster. I said this is just the latest neocon debacle. And I said explicitly it was going to leave Ukraine like Afghanistan. And it was completely avoidable. So that's what I tell them. I'm sorry. Listen. Pay attention. Learn something. That's what I say to them. Well, it's, it's clear that there's a lot more to this uh, story than uh, than the U.S. is letting on right now. Uh, it's also clear that uh, the Russian government's going to find out a lot about this because, of course, they uh, not, not only captured the four uh, perpetrators, uh, but uh, a widening uh, group that was uh, obviously involved in this, including uh, links to uh, uh, a network uh, in Turkey and uh, lots of suggestions of links to this network in Ukraine. So the big question, of course, is whether uh, uh, the Ukrainian government in one way or another was uh, involved in this. Uh, and there are lots of reasons to believe the answer could well be yes. Uh, the Ukrainian government uh, itself has been involved in uh, many terrorist attacks inside Russia. So uh, limiting terrorism has not been uh, high on uh, the Ukrainian uh, priority list. They've been blowing up people, assassinating people, uh, engaging uh, in terrorist attacks. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, perpetrators were fleeing to Ukraine. This is uh, perhaps the most notable concrete fact that uh, we certainly know uh, at this stage. Uh, and uh, President Putin said that uh, in, in his uh, guarded remarks, he said that uh, there was some kind of window uh, for these perpetrators. They were obviously fleeing in a particular direction that they knew and they were expected uh, to be received inside Ukraine. Uh, we've heard in the last uh, 24 hours of the number of, quote, ISIS-related uh, jihadists or whatever, or activists or those operating under that name living in Ukraine false passports, uh, linkages uh, that uh, put uh, some group inside Ukraine. And we know, quite frankly, that the United States uh, has been running jihadists uh, for uh, more than uh, 45 years, actually. Uh, this goes back uh, to Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, bringing in uh, jihadists uh, from the Middle East to uh, fight in Afghanistan as a trap uh, to bring the Soviet Union into uh, Afghanistan in 1979, something that Brzezinski explained in a famous interview in Le Nouvel Observateur in 1998. 
that the U.S., yes, used the jihadists for this purpose. And mm. after that, the U.S. continued to recruit Al Qaeda, uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, links and others uh, in many places uh, in the world, uh, in Syria, uh, when uh, Obama sent the CIA in to overthrow Assad, uh, who did he arm? Uh, jihadists. Uh, well, how, and, uh, how, um, how credible is the United States government claim within 55 minutes of the report of the attack that this was done by ISIS-K. A, how credible is that? And B, what is, in your view, ISIS-K? Nothing the United States says about this has any credibility whatsoever because the United States lies about everything uh, repeatedly, especially uh, about uh, all issues uh, of this sort. So it could be true, but the fact the United States said it so quickly after the attack and so authoritatively makes it less likely to be true than more likely to be true. It did not say we will work with the Russians to uncover the perpetrators of this horrible crime. Uh, it said within uh, basically uh, minutes, uh, this was not Ukraine. Uh, this was uh, ISIS-K. We know how this was done. Uh, now, this raises uh, a great many questions, many more questions than are answered by such a statement. But we know that the United States uh, engages uh, in uh, jihadist-linked uh, terror uh, and has done so for decades. Uh, in, uh, in the Balkans, uh, it has done so in the Middle East, it has done so in Central Asia, and uh, it could very well have done so, or its client uh, could have done so uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. So nothing the United States says about this uh, uh, proves uh, anything. In fact, in my view, it has no weight or uh, adverse weight. But uh, what we do uh, and should expect is uh, to learn more information from Russia itself. Can you see any dots connecting the horrible statement by uh, Victoria Nuland two weeks before she left office that President Putin should expect some nasty surprises and this tragedy at the concert hall on Friday evening? Of course. <laughs> of course. It, it may not refer to this, but uh, it very well could have referred to this. Nothing about the U.S. action should be taken uh, for face value. That is the first principle of understanding U.S. foreign policy, which is that there is a deep and very often dark side to this. Victoria Nuland uh, was always part of that. Uh, nasty surprises, what did she mean? Well, it could have been using American cluster munitions against civilian populations uh, in Russia. That has been going on now for the last two weeks. It could mean that uh, there was going to be some kind of terrorist attack that uh, they roughly knew about or explicitly knew about. Who knows? We will not be told the truth by the United States about any of this. But it doesn't mean we won't learn the truth, because uh, with Russia having uh, captured the perpetrators uh, alive and now apparently uh, with the further information developed uh, with Turkey or so were explained in the last 24 hours, uh, I'm sure that we're going to hear a lot more about this. What we do hear from uh, Russian uh, observers close to the government is a pretty uh, continuing uh, drumbeat that there are links with Ukraine. And this could be based on uh, real information uh, that will come forward to us. It could be based on surmise. At this stage, we don't know. 
but uh, I would not take anything for face value. And we are learning lots of uh, details that point towards Ukraine, at least, though they do not in any way uh, dispositively uh, prove that this is the case yet. Yesterday, uh, the United Nations Security Council, after five tries, three vetoed by the U.S. and Great Britain, one by the U.S., quite properly vetoed by Russia and China because it really didn't say anything of substance, the fifth with the U.S. abstaining and Great Britain and all others voting in favor, calling for an immediate ceasefire uh, in Gaza. A, were you surprised at the U.S. vote? And B, what, if anything, will be the effect of this Security Council resolution, Professor Sachs? Well, I, I was surprised at the vote, but then I was surprised at what we've learned since then, that uh, the U.S. government is going out of its way uh, now, uh, apparently by the hour and by the spokesman to emphasize this is non-binding. I don't even know what this means. I've never heard anything like this, but uh, the U.S. is uh, going out of its way to distance itself from its own abstention and from this resolution. So again, I'm sorry to say it, but nothing of this administration makes sense. And we don't hear the truth about almost anything. This is not a non-binding resolution. That even makes no sense at all. Well, I don't want to this raise your you blood pressure, uh, but I'm going to play a brief montage uh, of the American ambassador, Israeli ambassador, and Palestinian ambassador sitting on the Security Council. You'll be very unhappy with the uh, American ambassador and Israeli, but I'll let you comment on it uh, after we hear it. It's just about a minute long. Cut 14, Chris. We fully support some of the critical objectives in this non-binding resolution, and we believe it was important for the Council to speak out and make clear that our ceasefire must, any ceasefire, must come with the release of all hostages. The resolution just voted upon makes it seem as if the war started by itself. Well, let me set the record straight. Israel did not start this war, nor did Israel want this war. This must be a turning point. This must lead to saving lives on the ground. This must signal the end of this assault of atrocities against our people. A nation is being murdered. A nation is being dispossessed. Does the UN Security Council, does the United Nations itself have the means of enforcing these resolutions? If the Security Council acts together and if the United States would follow through on the UN Security Council as it is obliged to do, then it absolutely has the ability under the UN Charter and under international law to enforce its own agreements. By the way, the United States can enforce it straightforwardly by stopping the arming of this genocidal attack by Israel on the people of Gaza. So the United States by itself can stop this assault and should, but the Security Council together can put in sanctions, can put in peacekeepers, can enforce its own resolutions. There's nothing about this resolution that is quote, non-binding. I don't even know how they dream up these things in the State Department, uh, except to basically prevaricate uh, and uh, undermine any uh, semblance of international law after having uh, this vote 14 to nothing in the Security Council call for an immediate ceasefire. 
So while this was happening, the Israeli Defense Minister Gallant was in the Pentagon. Uh, Ron Dermer and other uh, civilian high-ranking members of Prime Minister Netanyahu's government were about to board a plane for Washington to go to the State Department in the White House. Prime Minister Netanyahu <clears throat> turned them around. They hadn't actually left, but he said, uh, you're not going. Um, is this a legitimate diplomatic response or or what is it? Because as you pointed out, notwithstanding Joe Biden's uh, language, notwithstanding uh, Ambassador Thomas's vote, we're still spend, sending spare parts and ammunition and weapons to them on a daily, to the Israelis on a daily basis. And... Uh, Netanyahu says on a daily basis that Israel is going to attack in Rafah, the southern city, where the two million people of Gaza are now packed because they were told to go there for safety. And the Biden administration goes out of its way every day to say we're against that, but there are no red lines to the use of our munitions. And is therefore absolutely complicit in all that is happening now with the 33,000 deaths to date and with hundreds of thousands of people on the brink of starvation and deaths from starvation occurring every day and emaciated children dying in the few still functioning hospitals in Gaza and the United States continues to support this. This is the real truth. It's shocking. It's absolutely against the will of the American people. It's absolutely against international law. And it is the ongoing policy of President Joe Biden. Here's um, Admiral Kirby cautioning Don't again. Don't make me look at him, <laughs> but I, it's okay. <laughs> we'll do it again. <laughs> I apologize, but here's Admiral Kirby. No, it's okay. It's part of, it's part of our job. <laughs> right, right. Uh, cautioning against this, uh, this ground invasion. The ground invasion of Rafa is, is as reprehensible as anything the IDF has done for the reasons you just explained. The Israelis said, go south because we're bombing north. Everybody goes south. There were a quarter of a million people there. Now there's close to two million people where a quarter of a million once lived, and they're going to invade it. I don't think Kirby's words mean a damn thing, and I don't think we can ever believe him, but here he is. Is there any circumstance that the U.S. would support a Roth operation in the future? Are you ruling it out entirely, or are you ruling it out? It is very clear. We don't believe that a major ground operation in Rafah is the right course of action, particularly when you have a million and a half people there seeking refuge and no conceived plan, no verifiable plan to take care of them. We've been very consistent on that. The Netanyahu uh, government doesn't give a damn about the civilians in Rafah. I, I missed uh, it didn't come through on my side, but uh, it is absolutely clear that the Netanyahu government doesn't give a damn about the civilians uh, of Gaza or of Palestine. That's absolutely clear because they have been slaughtering them and they have been starving them. Uh, and now they're threatening uh, a, a, an invasion to uh, the very spot where uh, people were supposed to go to flee for their safety under uh, Israel's instruction. You can't make this stuff up. This is so vulgar, so clear, so unambiguous, and with so much American complicity, because we are arming Israel to do exactly this, and all of the hand-wringing that we have heard, all of the mumbles, uh, all of the excuses mean nothing, because our government doesn't act. And Netanyahu taunts the government. He says, Who's really in charge of the U.S. government? You or I? I'm in charge. That's what he says. And so far, he's proven to be right. He's yeah. in charge. I and think he has you... our president and our secretary of state wringing their hands, <laughs> but doing Netanyahu's bidding. I think you quoted in one of your recent pieces a confrontation between a younger 
uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Bill Clinton uh, expressing outrage that Netanyahu was basically saying to Clinton, he's in charge of the U.S. government. Now you're talking about 30 years ago when Clinton was in the White House. Look, we 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 really have a, a situation here uh, that I've not seen before. Of course, we knew the Israel lobby is powerful, but I've never seen this kind of weakness by a U.S. president about U.S. policy. You know, it's not a matter, by the way, even of the United States telling Israel what to do. It's about us. <laughs> what are we doing? We, you know what Israel says, they're going to do it with or without us. Okay, they do it without us, without our weapons, without our munitions. Now try it for a day, Israel. There's nothing there. You can't do it. Israel depends on the continued flow of American munitions, period. If Biden right. wants to stop this, he can stop it. That's actually his job. He's president of the United States. He doesn't have to be prime minister of Israel. He doesn't even have to tell Israel what to do. He just has to decide what the United States is going to do. That's his job. Transitioning. How did the collapse of diplomacy, the complete collapse of diplomacy between the United States and Russia come about? And when? Did it come about, Professor Sachs? As we've discussed, uh, there has been uh, basically uh, a, a plan of the United States government going back to the 1980s to break Russia. In the 1980s, it was to break the Soviet Union, part of the Cold War. At the end of the Cold War, at the end of 1991, when the Soviet Union uh, was... Uh, dissolved into the 15 successor states, including Russia as the legal successor state of the Soviet Union itself, the United States continued its Cold War past the Cold War. And everything that was done after that was an attempt to continue to weaken, divide, defeat Russia, or to create a kind of regime change uh, so that there would be a regime uh, that would be uh, suppliant uh, to uh, American interests. Uh, so this has been going on for a long time. There has not been diplomacy in the sense that you have uh, negotiations with each other, you follow through. And since especially 1999, when Bill Clinton <laughs> bombed Belgrade for 78 straight days. Unbelievable, uh, but bombed a capital of Europe for 78 straight days. No UN anything, just uh, Bill Clinton deciding to do it and ordering NATO to do it. There has been no diplomacy whatsoever with Russia. And every action the United States has taken since then has been unilateral. The U.S. withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile treaty with Russia in 2002, unilaterally, not on the basis of negotiation. The United States expanded NATO to seven more countries in 2004 against promises made and against Russia's express opposition to uh, the Balk Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia, and Slovakia in 2004. The United States invited Ukraine and Georgia to become members of NATO without any negotiation with Russia. The United States participated in a violent coup against the Ukrainian government without diplomacy with Russia. The United States undermined and effectively torpedoed the Minsk agreements without diplomacy with Russia. When President Putin said in, uh, I should add, the United States unilaterally abandoned the Intermediate Nuclear Force Agreement in 2019, 
without diplomacy with Russia. In 2021, when President Putin said we urgently need a new security arrangement, in December 15, 2021, the United States explicitly refused to engage. When Ukraine and Russia reached a tentative peace agreement in March 2022, the United States sent the word, do not sign an agreement, no negotiation. When President Putin said, we are open for negotiations, the United States response is, there is no one to negotiate with. There is no diplomacy. The idea is the U.S. gets its way, except the U.S. doesn't get its way. The U.S. ends up destroying one country after another. Afghanistan, Syria, Ukraine, Libya, because if you don't have diplomacy and you resort to supposed covert operations or to overt war, you create destruction. The U.S. has forgotten how to have diplomacy. There is none. And that is why we are in a war in which hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians have died, in which tens or hundreds of thousands more will die unless we somehow rediscover diplomacy and how Ooh. Ukrainian is being pulled apart. It's not that the options get better. They get worse and worse and worse and worse because we're always told this isn't the time to negotiate or there's no one to negotiate with. And the country gets picked to pieces. We didn't even try once to negotiate. So this is a complete, utter failure of the most basic principle of at least try to talk to the other side. Well, we have a, a president who hurls a taunts and personal insults uh, at uh, state leaders around the world. He called President Xi of China a dictator. Uh, he said, but by so, the way, just after just after having sat down with him and right. supposedly calmed matters, the next word is, well, he's a dictator. Right. Uh, what he said about President Putin is even worse. He's called him a, a crazy SOB. How can this guy be in power? He's made it so obvious that uh, the United States was this is a, a failure. You know, this using Ukraine as a battering ram to attempt to drive. President Putin uh, from power and the United States is using violence. I mean, if the CIA uh, knew about um, the attack on the uh, concert and looked the other way or had anything whatsoever to do with facilitating, it's an act of war. The use of American military equipment to uh, fire American ammunition inside of Russia is an act of war. And they're not talking to each other. Has diplomacy between the United States and China also broken down completely? Or is there some rudimentary communications going on? There is rudimentary communication. But basically, again, a, a complete inability of the United States to follow through on its word on almost anything. You know, we have a one China policy. That means we do not recognize Taiwan as a separate country. And this is the standing basis of our relations. And in 1982, the United States signed a communique with China saying that we would not arm Taiwan for the long term, that we would reduce the armaments and that there was no intention for any long-term military support to uh, a, a part of China, after all. And yet, what are we doing right now? We are 42 years later, we're arming Taiwan, and there are now troops on the ground on one of the islands of 